here. <clears throat> Thank you and welcome. Um, so uh, we have no public hearing. That is item two. Uh, item three is the opportunity for the board members to pull any items off the consent agenda that they wish to discuss further. I was going to request that item 4.6 Pulled, I just have a couple questions. Okay. Being that, that, uh, move a, oh no, you need to take um, that item will be discussed at the end of the open meeting, uh, so it's not going to be discussed now. Um, I will find out. But now, please, it's not my job. Um, uh, it's time for a public comment on the entirety of the consent agenda. Good evening. My name is Becky Steinbrunner. Uh, thank you for pulling item 4.6. I had questions about that as well. Um, on um, item 4.3 in the operations and maintenance, I note that the, your board has still not um, had any reviews or public discussions of the water transfer pilot purchase price as was requested by Director Jaffe on August 18th, 2020. I would really like to see that, especially since the uh, city of Santa Cruz, I know the pilot is pretty much ended, but the, the agreement is still there. And the city of Santa Cruz is doing some amazing projects that will really encourage regional water sharing. Item 4.4, uh, Public Outreach Committee. Um, I note there was only one committee member there and the same for uh, item 4.5, only one committee member there, lots of staff. <laughs> so I'm wondering um, why these meetings are happening, what's their purpose, and I would really hope that there could be more ratepayers involved in these committees. Um, item 4.8, the salaries. I note that all employees are getting a 5% raise effective January 1st even though the CPI for our area, cost price index, is 2.8%. I, um, I know you have good employees, but your district is in financial trouble. And so I really uh, am worried about that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, that, we discussed that. And, couple meetings beforehand, you know, in the past. So this is just a, on the consent agenda because it's officially, officializing the whole process. So it was long in coming and lots of negotiation. And President Christensen, I'll note that there's some incorrect information spoken just then regarding the 5%. Yes, it is out there. Uh, I know, but it was on, on there. Did you want to elaborate just on the incorrect information? She has a, mis a misunderstanding of it, that not all employees got a 5% um, uh, CIP inflation adjustment. Um, I'll move approval of the remaining parts of the consent agenda. I'll second. I think all in favor? Can we? Yeah. yeah. All yeah we're all here. <laughs> Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, it's passed unanimously. Um, oral and written communications. This is for those of anyone who hasn't been here before. This is the opportunity to speak on items that are not on the agenda. Um, three minutes. Every person has three minutes. So we'll open it up for, to the public right now. Mm -hmm. 
And just um, to clarify, I got that information from your agenda packet, <laughs> so maybe I didn't read it properly. I'll look again. Um, for this piece, um, I want to uh, inform the listening audience and your board. December 15th, the uh, Central Coast Regional Water Quality Control Board will be considering the two permits for the Pure Water SoCal project one to inject the treated sewage water into the aquifer and it is not distilled water <laughs> i'm hearing people that have gone through the tour saying oh it's going to be distilled water it's not <laughs> and uh, the nitrate has been reduced to 1.67 milligrams per liter that's not distilled and the chloride will be 33 milligrams per liter that's not distilled so the public comment will be available, a public hearing that day in San Luis Obispo and also on Zoom. The second uh, permit considered will be to dump the um, contaminated, contaminated concentrate called brine into the Monterey Bay. I I'm happy to read the uh, application that it, there will be some mixing um, in a, a vault sort of affair before that goes out into our bay. And uh, there is a leak in the... Uh, outfall about 65 feet from shore so um, I'm happy to see that there will be some mixing I want to point out that there is no irrigation uh, permitted you with this recycled water it's not part of this permitting process it's clearly stated in there so your agreement with Twin Lakes Church to provide three acre feet a year of water for their irrigation for free for 50 years is going to be potable water until that permit is adjusted. I also want to uh, let you and the listeners know that the 2022 state-funded um, AEM, the uh, magnetic resonance snapshot of the, the Bay Area saltwater, freshwater um, interface, is now the the results of that is now out and available it's a much different kind of report than the one that the mid county groundwater agency which you helped fund in 2017 unfortunately the um, state helicopter did not fly very much over the area where um, i think is of most interest that is the area along the coast they only made two very broad and wide sweeps, but they did a lot of inland uh, exploration, which I thought was odd because um, when the MGA did theirs, they, uh, we were told that they couldn't fly over populated areas, but the state-funded helicopter did. So it's an interesting report, a much different report, and I urge you all to read it. Thank you very much. I'll just correct one thing. I think during the tour, Either people on the tour who spoke with you were misheard, but it's not distilled water. I don't think that ever comes up in the tour. It was just a misunderstanding. No one is presenting the outfall as it, at the output of this plant as distilled water. <clears throat> it's just a misstatement. I don't know. So, uh, any comments, oral communications from the board? Yes, I just wanted to ask. Um, I'm very interested in following through on getting some youth involved as non-voting members of our board or for some kind of a junior um, standing committee. And I would love to volunteer to head up that effort. And I'd just like to have that um, possibly be agendized um, at a future meeting. There are no uh, reports. We're on to administrative business. Uh, 7.1, uh, no conditional or unconditional will serves uh, reported today. And uh, 7.2 is the annual election of vice president by the board of directors. And this is a process where whoever is uh, elected to the vice presidency moves to be the president for the next year. Uh, so I, since I'm speaking, I will make a, if anyone else, I'm nominating uh, 
Rochelle Lather to be the vice president. Second. Any comments? Any comments from the public? Okay. Can we do this by acclamation also? Okay. Okay. All right. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. Congratulations, Sabra. <laughs> Thank you, Rochelle. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, review and consider compensation for district directors according to ordinance tw number 2001. And uh, if, any, if anybody in the, in the public has looked at the packet, uh, oh, Tracy's going to talk about it. Okay. Looks like I'm on. Can you hear me? Good evening, uh, President Christensen and board. I'm presenting to you tonight the, um, the board's opportunity to review and consider compensation changes for uh, directors. Um, as you know, we have ordinance number 20-01 that um, sets forth the process uh, by which the board takes action on its compensation. And that ordinance is governed um, under California Water Code for, um, for uh, the amount that is set forth in the code for um, annual adjustments by a public agency such as ours. Um, so I'm presenting to you tonight um, information in regards to our current uh, board compensation levels. As you can see in the memo, um, the district currently pays board members $200 per day for each day's attendance um, at regular board meetings. Excuse me, the compensation, um, <clears throat> the ordinance uh, sets forth the compensation. And um, currently the, the rate, the 2023 rate is at $200 per day for each day's attendance at a regular board meeting. $200 per day for each day's attendance at standing committee meetings, $200 per day for each day service rendered that involves out of town travel and $100 per day for authorized service within Santa Cruz County. Included in uh, the memo as part of the attachment number two, um, you can see the history of director's annual compensation adjustments. It's pretty rare that you guys give yourself adjustments um, and that uh, attachment two on, on the item um, certainly shows that history. Um, if the board is considering um, uh, compensation adjustments, um, obviously we've all been talking about inflation. So uh, if, if you are considering adjustments um, this year, the board has the accumulative percentages available of up to $113.43 per each of those line items that I just addressed. And if there's any questions, I'm happy to um, answer them. On this? I do. So, this is public service. There is compensation, um, but I don't think any of us are doing it here for the compensation. So, um, and in the 21 years I've been on the board, there's been two times when there's been an adjustment, and. Uh, I don't think an adjustment needs to occur. I will say that um, some meetings where there's large packets, it can take many hours to prepare for the meeting in addition to the meeting time. So it's not just the meeting time that the directors are putting into this work. Yeah, I think I, it was I who proposed the last rate adjustment, but I don't, I'm not calling for that at this point either. Um, we are trying to recognize costs and uh, doing our part to uh, increase those costs. Uh, does it get closer to the mic? What? Closer you to the mic, please. Oh, sorry. Um, well, anyway, I'm going to open up to the public if they have any comments. Can, can I say one thing first? Okay, um, or should we lis listen to the public first? No, I think. Okay. 
Any, any comments from the public? Well, uh, Tony Crane, uh, I'm a paying Cocoa Creek member. Um, so it sounds like you're, you're not thinking about requesting an increase. Is that what we're saying? Okay. That seems the consensus at the moment. Okay. We haven't yeah. voted yet. That, that's good. I would suggest that. I think it would be in poor taste at this point when we're looking at rate increases to do something like that. So I appreciate that. Thank you. I'll, I'll make, oh, you, go ahead. You know, I have a strong change of opinion, and I think that increasing the stipend would attract more diverse and also more youthful individuals, and we need to create a better equipped board to address the upcoming complex challenges associated with climate disruption and growth in complex water policies in our future. So the state law provides for a daily stipend of 313.43, and I think we should definitely have what the law allows. I think this, again, would really increase our diversity. Um, and we're not thinking about just ourselves, but everyone else that, who could participate. So that's, I'm strongly urging this. Thank you. That's a good point. Um, I don't know that we need to make a motion if we're, unless we want to increase it, right? It's take no action. Is yeah. Correct. That's correct. Increased. So no motion is required. And if the board doesn't, we should take action. Mm -hmm. But feel free to make. Uh, I don't think we're going to act this year. And then Jennifer can make you want to make a motion? Sure. I, I um, make a motion to adjust the current board of directors' compensation. Um, that's two hundred dollars per day, up to the required, the allowable three um, thirteen point four three for regular board meetings, standing committee meetings, and services rendered as a director involving out of town travel to amount of three thirteen forty three. Are any takers on this motion? I don't believe there's a second. Okay. Thank you. And thank you for your good. I, you know, I sympathize with that. I think it would help, help, but I think it, this is not the appropriate moment. All right. Uh, moving on to 7.4, it's requesting board direction on the uh, 2023 rate study proposed rate structures. And uh, that's what we've been trying to discuss. And I know costs are involved. Uh, you know, costs are implicit with that, but we'd like to get that refined. And are you going to take it over? Yeah, so tonight I'm here to present item 7.4. We did bring a um, rate memo to the board at the November 20th meeting. <clears throat> and at that time, uh, we were modeling the modified two tier structure and the three tiered rate structure with a 50% fixed cost allocation and a 50% uh, variable uh, use cost uh, allocation. And so tonight, we're uh, at that board meeting, the board requested that we bring back some more modeling and to identify the structures at uh, a 40% fixed cost allocation, 50%, and 60%. So Raftelis did the modeling and um, put together some slides for us that show what difference that does make. Um, we have kind of worked very hard uh, this time on the rates. I know this is a difficult rate uh, study that we're undergoing right now. We have worked very hard uh, at different modeling attempts and it, it's not moving the needle very much, but we will we will show you what those changes that we made to the structure, what that impact does have on the customer bills. Yeah, so, and, and tonight presenting, you, you gave an intro. Um, our assistant general manager, Melanie Mal Schumacher, is going to present and then followed either by uh, Kevin with Raftelis, and he's doing dual role tonight. So if he is not uh, able to, Jump over to our meeting. Leslie's going to fill in and do do that part too. I'll hand it to Melanie. Thank you. Great, thank you. I have about a half a dozen slides. Again, mostly for the general public and those who may watch this 
recording later. Just a kind of some slides to introduce again the district, our water challenges, and kind of the information that helps feed into the rate study that is currently underway. So obviously, you know, many of us know um, who are intimately working or presiding over the SoCal Creek Water District um, that we are a not-for-profit local government agency specializing in uh, water. Specifically, for now, we are 100% groundwater and we're providing, and our mission to, uh, is for safe, high-quality, reliable, and sustainable water supply uh, for our community's present and future needs and, of course, in an environmentally and economically responsible manner. Um, we are a small but mighty water agency. We do serve the unincorporated areas of Santa Cruz County, including Aptos, La Selva Beach, Seascape, Seacliff, uh, Soquel, and then, of course, portions of the incorporated area of the city of Capitola. We serve about uh, 40,000 customers or residents through 16,000 connections approximately. And um, we're proud to be able to provide water to residents, but, as, uh, but also to uh, support over 18,000 jobs, 22 parks in our region, and also 18 schools. As you can see on this infographic, this just itemizes kind of some of the day-to-day -day, um, uh, activities, programs, projects, and infrastructure that make up the SoCal Creek Water District. Obviously, we always like to start with kind of the why. Obviously, for us, it's all about water. Um, and we're proud of that. But with water um, in Santa Cruz County comes our local water supply challenges. OK, thank you. It's probably a lot better. Thank you. Um, comes, it's still, oh, there you go is um, the water supply challenges that we've been facing for a couple of decades. And that, of course, is something that we've been talking about um, with the public uh, for, for many years. And that is that we are challenged with seawater contamination of our groundwater basin. The Santa Cruz Mid-County Groundwater Basin has been designated as one of 21 basins in California with the designation of being critically overdrafted and a high priority. Um, and we are mandated um, here to bring the basin back into sustainability by 2040. Locally, a groundwater sustainability agency was established uh, with the provisions to create a groundwater sustainability plan. SoCal Creek Water District is a part of that groundwater sustainability agency. We're, of course, also faced with additional challenges, including stricter water quality standards, such as chromium-6, and also addressing future climate change impacts. Can I address this for a second? I think this is such a critical slide just for the couple new uh, uh, folks uh, new in the audience. Seawater intrusion, that's our nemesis. And you can see the red uh, up in the upper graph there, upper photograph. And the red is seawater intrusion detected by technology, geophysical technology, right at our shoreline. We knew we had it at either side of the district where the red dots go in there and then the other side. Thank you, Melanie. Now, if you look at the lower graph, you can see that top graph's an inset right there. But as you go south, the seawater intrusion's in already three miles down in Watsonville. If you go on down to Monterey, it's about 10 miles in almost the Salinas. So now if you extrapolate out to the world, the vast majority, vast majority of populated coastal regions of the world that rely on groundwater already have seawater intrusion in them. It basically ruins your aquifer. But we have been given the gift through technology to know that it's knocking on our door. Our hydrologist said it'd be two years if we didn't change our pumping and, and ask people to uh, cut back in the emergency situation, just be a matter of a couple of years for the seawater intrusion, uh, wiped out our main well field. And if it was at our door, and it was. So it was stage three that we've been in, I think is a very prudent method. And again, we have the gift as a community to, fa to succeed where so many have failed before us, to stop it. And you can see just to the south, I mean, that's as close as you can get to home. If you go around the world, most, other, most others have failed too. So 
I think this is what Soquel Creek is uh, is a lot about is trying to prevent where others have not had the ability to to put up that good offense. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you, Ron. I think one other thing to point out, and of course it's kind of included in that first bullet, but you know we are locally sourced in terms of our water. We're also unlike a lot of areas in California that have a more diversified water portfolio. So we do not receive any state or imported water here in our region. It's only what is locally sourced from rainfall that falls on this side of the Santa Cruz Mountains. So it's another challenge that we're faced with. I think with the uh, bar down, I'm not able to. There we go. I solved it. Okay, as mentioned last time, and this is also something that we're, um, we do like to convey to, to the community members, is that we did conduct an economic impact study related to a sustainable water supply here in our region. Uh, Dr. Brent Haddad with UCSC um, conducted this study that kind of calculated the benefits related to a sustainable water supply with Pure Water SoCal um, being able to meet that water shortage gap and, and bring our basin to sustainability provided almost a billion dollars in economic benefit from both residential, environmental, and business needs. And the other important um, thing to note with relationship to this study was that he evaluated the cost of water with and without a, a water supply. And the findings were that without a sustainable water supply, without uh, an additional source, without having another supply like imported state water, uh, the outcome would be that we would have to charge our customers three times as much for water if we didn't have another source. Um, so one thing that we're proud of here um, is that SoCal Creek Water District and our project Pure Water SoCal has been recognized worldwide. Uh, last year in 2022, the International Water Association created a global film series by BBC Storyworks called Beneath the Surface. It featured 16 projects around the world, as you can see on that left-hand side, of projects that were really focused on water sustainability. The Santa Cruz County, California project, our project was one of two in the United States. And we were able to kick off the series back in September of 2022. And it really created, I think, uh, a lot of momentum and understanding uh, of our project and our challenges here. And then, of course, I think what makes uh, you know us a unique um, community in terms of really trying to involve you know, others is the community input. So we have on several occasions over the years gone out to ensure that we are working on initiatives that reflect the community's interest. Um, specifically right here, the three take home messages that I wanna highlight is nine out of 10 of our customers are, are in support of investment in infrastructure. About nine out of 10 really want us to take action now, recognizing the seawater intrusion that's been knocking at the door of our groundwater basin. And that three out of four of our customers are comfortable with Pure Water SoCal as we continue to educate, go out to the community and let them know that the treatment process includes you know, multi-step microfiltration, reverse osmosis, um, and then UV and advanced oxidation that that purified recycled water then goes back into the ground to create the multi-benefits of a seawater intrusion barrier as well as groundwater replenishment. As I mentioned previously, you know, we do always try to ensure that we're engaging public and, and the input. And so just wanting to highlight here, these are just kind of a snippet of things that are available. And this is just a small set of the tools that we use, but we do do a monthly e-blast that goes out to nearly 15,000 readers. We maintain a pretty robust website that's available 24 hours a day, seven days a week, um, that has a plethora of information. We issue news releases on our website as well as out to the media outlets. We attend um, a lot of community events. And of course, we've been doing quite a few tours. 
Um, not only is that outreach and engagement just on everything district wide, we also have built that into the water rate study that you're going to be hearing more tonight. And here, as you can see, um, with this water rate study that we're conducting in 2023, an ad hoc advisory committee was created. We established this committee in April, and they have been uh, very valuable in providing oversight and recommendations. Um, the committee is com comprised of 10 district customers and two of our board members, all who are rate payers. And they, their, their goal and objective is to review the water rate structures, understand the revenue needs and what kinds of programs and projects that we have um, in the next uh, four years and, and even out farther than that. And really it's to provide ideas, feedback and recommendations to reflect uh, uh, our customer base. It was a very diverse group. You can see on the picture on the right, that was just one of the many meetings that we've conducted over the six month process. And then of course, we're also conducting these public meetings here tonight um, as we continue to discuss this at board meetings. Oh yes, you wanna go ahead and introduce? Yeah, and in fact, we do have a committee member here tonight. Ilga's right there. Thank you for your participation. Okay, I think with that, I'm going to turn it over to either Leslie or Kevin. I think you have me. Um, I just heard from Kevin Kostick with Raf Tellus, and he's engaged on another presentation this evening. So I'll go ahead and cover his slides for him. And um, Melanie, thank you for, for that um, introduction. I think it's important for us to tell that water story over and over again because our challenges um, and the steps we're taking to resolve them feed right into our rate study. So tonight we're gonna take a look real quick at uh, where we've been on the rate study, the alternatives that we're looking at um, that you asked us to model and bring back to this meeting and the impact that might have on customer bills and then what our schedule is and the next steps for the remainder of the rate study period. So we, just to recap quickly, um, we started this process back in April. At that time, the board did indicate that they had some priorities when setting rates. Um, obviously, financial sustainability, we do need to make sure that the district is able to cover uh, the cost of service. We are a not-for-profit entity, so the cost of service does equal our revenue need. And it's important for us to maintain our district operations and to make sure that we're meeting our, our reserve requirements and our debt coverage requirements um, to, to remain sustainable with our, our debt covenants and, and the borrowing that we've done to date. Um, in addition to financial sustainability, obviously legal defensibility is important. Um, and then as well, probably the most important maybe is social equitability. Um, we want to make sure that under the, under the auspices of Prop 218 that we are treating all of our customer classes uh, equally and that the rates are allocated among them in an equitable manner. So we brought the financial plan back to the board. Um, I believe that was the October meeting we brought that. We had an estimate of that time of probably a 12% overall uh, annual rate increase or not rate increase, but revenue increase year over year for a four-year rate study. Um, so that has kind of fed into the rates and where we are right now. There were some other options available under the finance plan and recovering that revenue. One of them was like a huge bump up uh, in year one and then tapering off to about 7.5% in years three or two through four. But I think we've decided or settled on, you know, roughly the 12% Revenue recovery is what we're looking at. Under the cost of service analysis, we have modeled a variety of different structures. We've looked at a uniform rate structure. Uh, we've looked at our existing tiered rate structure. Um, we've taken a look at our cost allocations in the uh, environment that we're setting rates in now. And so there is a modified two-tier structure and then ultimately the three-tier structure that we're you know, the two that we're looking at this evening. Um, we have heard the board's concerns. Um, we're trying to respond to some of the concerns you've expressed. We've heard the public's concerns. 
So we have modeled some different options for you this evening, but as I stated earlier, that needle is not moving a whole lot. The legal environment in which we're uh, setting our rates is a fairly narrow, uh, narrow avenue to, to navigate. Um, so the rate structure modifications we're bringing to you this evening are the revised two-tier and the three-tier option for residential customers, assuming a 12% annual revenue increase. And then we have modeled the fixed revenue recovery uh, at 40%, 50%, and 60% of revenue recovery. So let's take a look now at what that means. Um, so on the supply side, there are two different, uh, two different components to our supply costs. And one of those components is just overall basin sustainability, which benefits all of our customers, um, regardless of how much water is used. And then there is the supplemental supply component that may be um, more beneficial to higher water users than the lower water users. So we've taken a look and kind of divided the supply costs accordingly. Uh, the impacts between the um, two tier and the three tier are very similar at the same level of use. So if you're using two units, five units, nine units a month, they're, they're very similar in terms of what those tier options look like. Uh, the impact across the, the rates um, are driven by the modification of the residential rate structure um, and then the higher or lower fixed cost recovery has an effect on that bill impact as well. And so we'll take a look at what that looks like for each of those, uh, each of those options, the modified two tier and the three tier. So as I said, we're going to take a look at the revised or the modified two-tier rate structure and an alternate three-tier rate structure. And we're going to look at a, a revenue recovery on the fixed service charge of 40, 50, and 60%. And as I said before, all of these rates that we're showing you here this evening assume a 12% increase in revenue needs. So this is taking a look at the modified two-tier. Um, this is the volumetric rates. And you can see in the first column, you can see what those rates are currently. Um, customers are paying uh, $9.10 up to six units of water. And then anything over six units of water is being billed at uh, $41.23. Our commercial and irrigation rates are a weighted average of the tiered rates for residential, and those are coming in at $15.25 a unit. So if we take a look at uh, the three scenarios that we modeled, one of them was 40% fixed service charge, the remaining 60% of revenue coming from the volumetric charge, 50-50, or 60% on the fixed service charge and recovering 40% on the volumetric charge, you can see the, the impact that that has in terms of rates. So you're looking at a, a range of about $14 for Tier 1 all the way over to $9 for Tier 1, 20 all the way down to $14.69, and then, of course, your uh, commercial and irrigation rates. Um, because we're covering some of the peaking costs now in our rate, in our rate on our volumetric side of the rates, you are seeing some peaking differences between commercial and irrigation. So commercials coming in anywhere from 17 to 12 and uh, irrigation about $19, $20 down to $12.96. Now the reason for that, as you collect more revenue on that fixed service charge, your volumetric per unit water use rates go down. But that has a different impact on customer bills. So let's take a look. Ah, no, we're going to take a look at the three tier. <laughs> So you can see on the three tier, it's very similar. We're looking at a, a tier one from uh, zero to four units, four to eight units in tier two, and anything over eight units in tier three. And you can look at the uh, proposed rates under a 40%, 50%, or 60% fixed, and you can see that they're very similar to what you saw under the modified two tier. 
there's not a whole lot of difference there. It is giving our customers a little more water use uh, available to them at the lower tiers before they hit that upper tier. Um, that upper tier is where you see the conservation costs and that kind of thing start to kick in. So let's go ahead and go to the next slide here. This is where we're really going to take a look. Oh, these are the fixed charges. Um, you can tell these aren't my slides. I'm following Kevin's slides. So this is the fixed charge if we were to recover 40%, 50%, or 60% of revenue from the fixed charge. Um, 90, 95, 98% of our customers are on a 5 8 inch meter. Um, we're moving more and more customers off the 3 quarter inch meter, so that one's going to be phased out. Uh, one inch meter, we have very few residential customers utilizing a one inch meter, and I don't think we have any residential customers utilizing anything more than a one inch. The larger meter sizes are mostly for commercial and irrigation customers. So you can see how that fixed service charge increases depending on whether you're trying to get 40% of your revenue need on the fixed charge or if you're trying to get 60% of your revenue need on the fixed charge. So that increases. Um, the more you're trying to recover on the fixed charge, but it also uh, means that our customers don't have as much flexibility in um, managing their bill through their water use because more of the, that charge is fixed. So let's go ahead and take a look at the next slide. So now we're going to go ahead and take a look at some bill impacts. So if you were a household using two units of water a month, which equates roughly to one person, um, given our standard water use of about 55 gallons per person per day. Um, our current bill is running about $70 for two units a month. Under the 40%, that bill would go to 83. 50%, it would go to 90, 34. And for 60%, it would go to $100.56. So you can see the difference there. I mean, you're running all the way from, you know, about $12, $13 increase a month all the way up to $30 increase a month. So that fixed component does have a significant impact on the bills for low water users. Um, on the three tier, you're seeing very much the same thing. You can see the bill impacts are very close to what is shown on the two tier, running roughly 82 to, to 100. As a matter of fact, you get to 60% fixed in tier three and you're exactly where you are on 60% uh, fixed for, uh, for the other, or I'm sorry, not tier three, but for the bill. So you can see those bill impacts mirror each other very closely. There's not a whole lot of difference between the two different rate structures, but there is a huge difference between 40, 50, and 60% fixed. Now, if we go to the next slide, the next slide is going to model it for a household that uses about five units a month. And you can see that um, there again, it does have an impact, but not as great an impact as it would on the low water user at two units a month. Um, more of the revenue is being recovered from the fixed service charge at 60% fixed. Um, there's not a whole lot of movement between 40, 50, and 60% fixed at the five unit a month uh, consumption level. But then if you hop up to nine units a month, which is the next slide, you can see that um, the impact is actually reversed. For somebody using nine units a month, the bill actually goes down slightly. And that's because um, of the change in the tiered rates. Um, and the cost recovery on the tiered rate side. Uh, a lot of that has to do with recovering costs on basin sustainability, um, assuming a basin-wide benefit now that we're bringing the Pure Water, Pure Water Soquel project online, everybody's gonna benefit from a sustainable basin, um, whereas before uh, those startup costs were primarily um, in tier three. So that's why you're seeing the change mainly at the higher tier levels in terms of water, the water bill savings. And again, between uh, the modified two tier and the three tier, there's not a whole lot of difference in the bill, but there is a little bit of difference on the, on the fixed service charge. For the larger customer or the larger water use customer, 
the 60% um, fixed is a much greater savings to them than the 40% fixed. Where the opposite was true on the low water user, it was a, a much higher uh, impact for them on the 60% fixed and a lower impact to them on the 40% fixed. And Leslie, if I may chime in. At the last, thank you. At the last meeting, we had a, a member or two of the public that were concerned about their family size and the bill impact. And I, want, I don't want to go into specifics. I didn't use this much water. But we went back and we worked with them and we analyzed them based on what we were looking at last time the board was. And they would actually, the, this, the rate structure being, the rate structures being considered at that time would actually benefit them over the year. So they'd be saving money and, you know, they were talking about their situation. So I just wanted to kind of tie a, a back to how it, it actually reflects in our community. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And so let's go ahead and go on to the next slide. So this is just exactly what you saw on the previous slide, the previous three slides. You're seeing a comparison of the monthly bill impacts side by side now uh, for a two unit, five unit, and nine unit uh, household at the 40, 50, and 60% level. So you can see where um, it's more beneficial to a lower water user to have a lower fixed service charge and it's more beneficial to a high water user to have a higher fixed service charge. There again, the difference between the revised two-tier model and the three-tier model is not much. They're very similar. Let's go ahead and go to the next slide. And so this just kind of breaks it down uh, a little bit. The same things we've been looking at. Um, in terms of the impact of the bill on the customer for the 40, 50, and 60% fixed service charge. This is broken down into dollars per day. Um, and it also extrapolates out over the full four years so that you can see because of the rate structure modifications that we're discussing now in year one, that impact is greater in year one than it is in subsequent years. In subsequent years, that uh, increase in the water bill is not as significant it is, as it is typically in year one. What else have we got? Oh, this is the five, and this is the same slide we just looked at for the two unit household. This is the five unit household. And you again can see the impact per day. We're looking at about a dollar per day um, impact. And that decreases as you go out over time because that first year is impacted by the structural changes to the rates. Um, the subsequent years are just impacted by the increase in revenue need. And here we are for the nine unit customer. Their bill is going to go down the first year because of those structural changes. But then in subsequent years, it would go up um, relative to that first year it would go up by the annual revenue um, need, increase in revenue need. And so those are the models that we're presenting this evening. Um, both of those, or all of those residential rate alternatives um, differentiate between basin-wide sustainability in terms of what supply costs are allocated to basin-wide <coughs> sustainability allocated to just supplemental supply. Um, this looks like it's the same slide we looked at earlier. Impacts between the revised two-tier and three-tier options are very similar. We saw that throughout all three of those options and at all three levels of use that those two-tier and three-tier options are, are virtually identical. And then the impact across the users, again, are driven this first year in particular um, the modification of the residential rate structure is impacting that first year of rates. And then over the course of the rate study, of course, that would settle down and that increase would only then be 12%. Um, the lower your fixed revenue recovery, the lower the impact to low water users. The higher your fixed revenue recovery, the higher the impact to low water users and vice versa for high water users.
Uh, well, I, the committee didn't have an opportunity to see this model, but I think the committee's recommendations had been either the two-tier or three-tier options, and their recommendation had been the 50-50 cost recovery, which I think is what we presented to you at the November 20th meeting. That's what I, that's what I recall. Yeah. And then um, just to give you an idea of where we are in the rate study process, we are here at the Tuesday, December 5th meeting. We've brought you these rate alternatives. We've got another meeting on Tuesday, December 19th, where we hope to be able to have REF tell us bring a draft rate report to you. Um, the intent is to go ahead then once that rate report is um, formalized and approved by the board, we can go ahead then with noticing our customers with a Proposition 218 mailer. And then we anticipate having an open house and a public, or an open house actually, and a webinar before we have our public hearing 45 days after the mailer goes out. You're welcome. And I, just to just to recap your, your board actions tonight would be to provide us with direction regarding these structures that we presented this evening. Um, give us an idea of which ones you'd like to see brought back to you in the draft rate report, or you can take no action. Thank you. I think, first of all, in view of what happened at the last meeting, have board members ask any technical questions? Um, yeah, I, I would have the board have a hard uh, time picking it up in the back. Some technical questions and then release and then open it up to the public. So, are there any questions? Um, so, one of them, it doesn't seem like there's a whole lot of difference between the effect on the rate, you know, rate pairs on. The two chair or three chair, I mean, they're very similar at various levels. Um, but um, I didn't know if if there was any other information that would help us to make a decision on those that might be helpful. That's one thing. Um, secondly, you know, I had asked if there was any possible way to save money so we didn't have to increase it quite as much. And I didn't know if you'd looked at that. And then just those are my two questions and then I just wanted to just say that you know none of us want rates to go up um, and but we we have a commitment all of us to providing you know high quality water and and we have a commitment to saving the basin and and pr providing good quality water for years to come and I just wish that wasn't expensive and I think we've done a good job of trying to get grant money and all that but I just I I feel like we have a great staff and I want it seems like a lot of the costs for keeping everything running are to for our staff and 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 I feel like they all want to have a good place to work and be able to keep up with inflation and I would, you know, I feel like we provide a good place to work and that we want to attract and keep people that care about water and that feel like it's a good place to stay for a, a career. I think it's a more effective organization. So a lot of reasons that, you know, I, even though we wish we didn't have to, I just, I think we, we have to take care of our basin, our customers, and our employees. I just wanted to respond to your first question. Yeah, um, in the as far as I'm concerned, I was looking at the two rate structures are different in a way that's hard to show. But somebody that uses, let's say, a low amount of water, and then they have company, or they end up with an extra kid in the house, and maybe they were below the threshold for the first thing with the three rates structure they're not hit so hard for that it's not like oh this kid came to stay with me and all of a sudden it's a hundred dollars more or my toilet leaked and now I'm paying two hundred fifty dollars when I usually pay 70 which actually happened to me so um, so I have you know I have a feel for people 
that are at that point. And that's why we looked at the three rates. That's what it was for. Other, and the comparisons aren't as, as good because the, the, the um, spread of usage, I mean, at the lower end, it's not going to be that much different, but at the higher end, it is of that middle, range. In range. Yeah. yeah, in that middle range. Anyway, that's all I had to say. Yeah, uh, we heard after the last rate meeting, we heard a lot of comment from larger families about how difficult it was to keep their water rates down. And the committee uh, heard that commentary, the rate committee, and responded and responded with a preference for the three tier because it would be a softer landing. Well, and even any of these are. Mm -hmm. Taking care of one of the big worries I had is before they would go from, you know, single digits up to forty dollars a unit. You know, suddenly, so they're they're way better as far as being equitable for families of various sizes. Okay. Um, oh, yeah. Just one. Oh, you. Have no need. Um. There's an inconsistency on page 42 of 58, and I think I've talked with you about this before, Ron, and forgive me. The 5 eighths inch and the 3 quarter inch meter costs are the same, even though there's, and I think the response last time was there's not a lot of them and we're phasing them out. The, the 3 quarter inch meters are older meters. And we are in the process of phasing them out. But the new ultrasonic 5 8 inch meter has a flow rate very similar to the old 3 quarter inch meter. And that's why they're being handled the same. Okay. It's, it's, it's all to do with flow rate. And so if I understand this correctly, there's you're apportioning the sustainability of the basin um, and there's also flow peaking as part of this as well and setting the rates. Correct. We are capturing some of the peaking on the volumetric side, which is why you're seeing a difference between the irrigation customer and the commercial customer. And then the supply costs are being allocated across all users because there is a basin-wide benefit to all users who take water from the basin are receiving the benefit of a sustainable water source, of a sustainable basin. Okay, thanks. Now, Director LaHue, I believe you had a question that Ron was going to answer. Yeah, I mean, we can get into that uh, if you like right now, or did you want to hear? I think I did it covered by then. Okay, yeah. Well, I'll just, I'd like to start out with, um, before I just jump into cost savings, uh, nobody likes rate increases. Nobody, everybody, you know, nobody. Yeah, I, I don't think there's a person out there, whether what, whatever bill it is, but to supply high-quality water 24-7, and to fend off seawater intrusion is, um, it's not inexpensive to do that, and that's what we're faced with. And you'll see that other agencies are, are facing the same thing. Even Grover City, I believe, Grover Beach, 20% rate increases. I've seen some 50. So there's this precipice that you can see being hit in the water industry, whether you're an agency that didn't keep up with your infrastructure and your parents put that in and you're having to pay that bill. Fortunately, the district saw that coming in. It's been doing that because we knew we had a, a seawater intrusion. So I just want to say there's no easy way out. It's expensive, but the alternative is even worse, right? Seawater intrusion costs more, use less. With cost-saving measures, you know, as the board knows, we come to you every year with um, what we call an efficiency memo, uh, outlining items. It's just built into our system. So what do we... What can, where can we save? What can we do? And I jotted it down. I had somebody jot down 
So I, I can name a few of what we've done. I know you're looking forward to going to the future, but I think if I was sitting out there in the crowd, I'd like to know, you know, what have you, there's two things, right? Getting money and conserving money. There's actually a third I'll touch on, but for the sake of the audience, you know, we, the, the, we've done some big things, and I can talk about those at the end, but I think the small things give you the best reflection of who we are. And so I'm going to call off a couple of those. We outsourced, we just recently outsourced daily deposits to a lot box, allowing for a half-time reduction in a billing position, so a half-time FTE. Thank you, Leslie. We changed our merchant processing for credit cards that uh, uh, saves us money. We refinanced our certificates of participation in 2020. That saved about $7 million um, customers' money over the life of that. Uh, we have prepaid certain things down like um, OPEB and PERS, which Leslie may like to talk about tonight, but that is like prepaying your house payment. And yeah, everybody takes a little bit hit now, but in the long run, we, I think we estimated about 50 grand a year or something around that by doing that, maybe more. So these are the things we do. We, we, we get a list together of the software and stuff that everybody needs and updates, and then we don't buy it. We wait until like a Black Friday. We have somebody who watches that, and it was just just done, I think, recently. I saw, hey, the, your stuff will be coming because we can get a deal. Uh, one thing that I'm very excited and proud about that I've never seen really done, and I think we've transferred this to many agencies um, and organizations that I'm involved with, uh, what Leslie brought to the table, when you're a public agency and by our policy, you're not really allowed to invest in very risky stuff. We have to keep your money very safe, right? That's just the, the, the land of a, a public agency. Um, however, and so interest rates have been so low that there was nothing, or we would be getting about 0.2% or something like that, I think, in life. And then we saw interest rates climb up to like 5 6 7%. And, and discount rates. And so we started taking your money and putting it in CDs, federally insured, through different banks, up to 250 k So if the bank fails, you get your money back at, I don't know, 5% on average? Yeah, we're getting about 5%. So, I mean, it, when I shared that with other agencies and a couple uh, organizations I'm involved with, they started doing the same because you get locked into, we can't make any money. But So that that was another big one. I could I could go on for that. The other, of course, mega one is not a cost savings, but we have actually stayed up all night running, flying, driving in cars, uh, and many other episodes to win you uh, grant and low interest loans. So the grant funding is close to $100 million. I don't think I've ever seen an agency our size you know, we're a small agency, but we've got a big problem. That's that's how we're recognized from the outside to garner such funding. And it's not just the funding, you know, 65 million roughly from the state water board, 30 million recently from the Bureau of Reclamation. But the Bureau of Reclamation controls half the water in the West. They are the premier water federal water entity. The state water board is the premier California water agency, and they're investing and in your money. Then we got an EPA loan. The loan is about, what, 1.6? 1.3. So they, the delta, if you had to go out on the street and get a loan, that's millions of dollars itself. So there's many things we have done. We went back and looked at it, and, and we made a list of things that we could do that I don't think are going to make it in time for this rate structure. So I'm moving from the past to the future. Or, but uh, Things like uh, somebody brought up a uh, property. Potentially, we own two really probably semi-valuable properties. Uh, the, the Glenwood property, although it's not, it's 100 acres. It's so steep, it's not valued that highly. And then, of course, the property next to our uh, agency, which is probably worth a couple million. Um, we have to evaluate as we go work with our neighbors through an optimization study, which is a 7.6 million dollar another grant we got to see if there's any benefit to them or us uh, and whether we need that property and other properties. So that's that kind of thing is going to be a ways out. We looked at a host of things, and I don't, I'm not going to bore you with the list, but all the way down to there's this thing called Harvest Host where if you have a, a little RV, you can park on uh, 
public entity's property overnight and you just park and go the next morning, but you slip like 20, 25 bucks in the, in the slot or whatever. And the point of that is that money could be used for others that need it. It's not tied up to, to whatever, but we're, we're exhausting everything. Cell phone towers, allowing that was another uh, idea. But the, the bottom line is, of all those ideas, we don't think there's anything that could be, if it was to be acted upon, you know, even uh, building places to rent, you know, that was another thought, but could be done in the time frame for this rate uh, uh, study. However, however, however we do have possibly one option available, available to the board. We did go back and look at, um, as Ron indicated, one of our cost saving measures is to pay down that unfunded pension and other post-employment benefit liability that we have on our books. By paying that down um, earlier rather than later, we saved the district a ton of money uh, in avoided interest costs. However, um, we have the ability this year, if you are interested in taking the money that we would have set aside for pre-funding and not spending it on pre-funding, that would be available to reduce the revenue need in year one to help offset that impact of the, the structural changes on our customers, if you were so interested. Um, if we were to do that, it would probably drop the um, revenue need in year one from 12% down to about 10%. I wouldn't recommend doing it every year simply because it is a cost saving measure, but I think if we did it one year to help 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 our customers with that structural change, um, that that might be an option available to you. And then what would be the uh, estimated savings that we would be foregoing on that? Um, in year one, because of the Interest rate environment that we're in right now, I don't think we'd see that big of an impact because we are getting a better return on the, uh, the money that's set aside for unfunded liabilities. We are getting a better return on it right now than we have in years past. So if we were back in the ages of 2% uh, interest, I would maybe not suggest it. But right now, the earnings on that are sufficient that I think it would float us for a year. We wouldn't have to make those payments. I just want to, sometimes um, it slips out that we're talking about a rate increase. We're really not, there is a change in the rate structure, but the real increase is in the revenue that's needed. Correct. And our task here is to come up with a rate structure that is fair as fair as possible for the needed revenue increase. Correct. Okay. And the next item was about the public Let me ask, we just got word from back there that they're having a hard time picking up some of the board members. Yeah, so if you would be like. I'm usually too just, loud. So. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> For all of you, though, we just got noticed. So what was your question, Director? My question was that the next hearing that we're doing or the next meeting is when we talk about what the rates are going to be. Um, that is when the draft report would come to you and would show you exactly what those rates are going to be. Now, I've shown you this evening what the rates would be under the 40, 50, or 60 percent scenarios. Assuming 12% increase. Assuming a 12% increase. Now, I can tell you that if we were to enact a 10% uh, increase in revenue this year rather than 12%, because we would be uh, not doing the pre-funding, um, on a, on a two-unit bill, um, the impact, instead of being like $19 uh, a month, 1972 a month, it would be down to about 1815 so it saves it saves them it saves them a little over a dollar a month on a five unit bill that impact is closer to two fifty a month so it's not huge 
You know, I, when you take when you take something like that and you extrapolate it out over fourteen thousand customers, the impact of it gets diluted. It's hard. It's hard to move that needle. Um, I think we've shown that a little bit by coming back to the board uh, a couple of times now with some rate alternatives and. You can see that that needle hasn't moved much each time, but a little bit um, every time is, you know, every little bit helps, I'm sure. Uh, well, it's a far cry. I have the figures at Grover Beach, and they're asking for a, having to impose a 24% increase the first year of their rate study because they don't have the, um, haven't been able to get the funding that we did for the, for the projects they needed to do to prevent seawater intrusion. And this is a place down south. And I also heard from um, Honolulu, Hawaii, they're imposing a 63% rate increase over five and a half years because of the same reason. They're uh, all over the world, the options for, uh, Finding new water sources are getting harder and harder. It's not merely a digging a well. It's coming up with a complicated project to prevent seawater intrusion. I mean, 70% of the world's coastal areas are at risk at the moment for uh, contamination due to seawater intrusion. So this is an immense problem worldwide. And uh, the projects designed to, available to solve that problem are limited and expensive. So we are really, uh, by jumping in and moving as quickly and decisively as we did in the past eight years, we have come to this where we are not talking about a 24% increase. We are talking about 12 and maybe 10%. So I'd like to hear from the public at this point to, uh, they, well, if you've understood what's going on, and if you don't, your questions, and if you do, your comments on it and your reaction. So. Hi, Chris Kirby. So we didn't get financials for four months, and we've got them last month, and we haven't gotten them. We didn't get any more today. And I've heard Leslie say that we have an 11, or the water district has an $11 million shortfall. Where does it show that? Where are the financials? It's like you're just trying to do this increase, but where does it make sense financially for us to see that? That's a fair question. I mean, she just, just doesn't give us financials every month. I don't understand that. Isn't that her job, her responsibility? Shouldn't we see that? You guys saw it. Financials. I, we, I can't hear you. Finance not, status reports were presented to the board last meeting. But that was a month ago. So is there an $11 million shortfall? Ms. Kirby, please. Not, please, it's not in please, one year. It's over Ms. a span of three years. Ms. Kirby, please, I, I would suggest you use your time, and then we can, if the board so chooses, <laughs> So respond. that's a no answer. Um, it's also confusing to people the two to three tiers where it goes from six to four, and nobody really talks about that. So you're getting less water. I don't know. It's, it's kind of unclear. But, and I would also like to know, the Pure Water Soquel, can you guys guarantee the, cl the cleanness of it and the, the, that it's pure for us to drink? I'd like to know if it's if if there is a guarantee of that. I think it's state law requires us uh, to have that. Yeah, it would just, uh, it would just be nice for somebody for you guys to say we guarantee that it's it's good clean water because it scares most of the people out there. Your numbers on that chart are not what I t when I talk to people. We sit out places and talk to people about it, and it's, people are freaked out about it. So it would be nice to see the financials where this really is an, a needed thing. Um, can I just address a couple things? Yeah. Yeah. So on the question about the difference between the, the two tier and three tier, it's just a number. It's the amount of water used. So there's a certain price for the first four units and then another tier for the four, four through eight and then above eight. The two tier 
as the breakpoint at six. So there's a price for zero to six, and then the second tier is six or above. So that's the difference there. Um, and as far as I'll just make a comment on water quality, we've said it before, but you know we went through a long process to make sure that it would be safe for people and had experts from toxicology, the water industry, you know, I feel very comfortable that the technology is safe. It's been used in Orange County for 40 years and it keeps, you know, so I'm, there are fail safes to, to protect us all that no water that's contaminated would go into our groundwater. So I feel comfortable, but I mean, it wasn't initially, I, it, we all had to have it proven to us, so. Nicole Malcolm. Um, so the tier levels, I don't really understand what's behind the choices for the tiers or any of the particulars to understand the final result. But what's curious to me is, and I sympathize with the gal with the large family and the higher water bill, um, because that's a reality for people who use more water than other people who don't whether it's by family or irrigation, larger property, whatever the, the situation is, especially for a large family. So I'm wondering, um, since we're supposed to be saving water and the focus is to manage towards reduced use of water, why more water usage would actually be less costly is a question to me. So that, I'm just going to put that out there. And then secondly, something popped into my head after the last meeting we attended, and I encourage you to kind of think about, it seems like there's a lot of collaboration with UCSC, and they are here in, in our area. I'd like to see you maybe start talking about maybe a scholarship or something and have UCSC participate in one of their environmental type classes, you were talking about wanting to get young people involved, have them go to it and present to you their different program plans and have a scholarship for a winner of the plan that really is a viable plan. Maybe you'll get some other ideas, you know? And it would be a really positive way to involve the university and the kids. And I think really a useful focus. So just an idea. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, sorry. Um, but your question about the tiers again, there's still, if someone uses more water and goes into the next tier, it's still costing them more per unit of water. Still costing more per gallon of water. But it's costing them more for you, so you're going to be better off, and it's still got a conservation incentive. It's cheaper to use less water. So they're not going to be able to hear you because you're not up at the mic. So I just want to let the just TV pick up. The question yeah. So I can I can definitely if the board would like uh, I think those were thoughtful questions, and I'll, I'll start with the big question the 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 tier structure and why does it is it geared toward helping larger families but might uh, it, it's higher cost to to the lower users, and in the past we saw that. We didn't know if we were going to uh, a supplemental supply, Pure Water SoCal was going to come online. So we said anybody who's using above the sustainable amount could be contributing to further overdraft over the sustainable amount. So that was where the majority of the costs lied before we knew whether we would actually have the plant to come to fruition, which is about 80, 90% done now. Now we see that it will be producing water to the benefit of not just higher users, but to the sustainability of the basin to fight seawater intrusion. And mind you, the seawater intrusion started back in the 80s. So it's not just by high users, it's by everybody. 
So the idea is that as the plant comes on, it's not just to the benefit of the high users, whether it's a large family, as you said, large lawn, you are, you, you, everything you said was spot on, but it's, it's to the benefit of everybody to protect that supply. It doesn't matter whether you're a low user, high user, or you've switched over time or will switch again. That seawater barrier that we're presenting, the hydraulic barrier, will protect our water supply, where, as I said, so many have failed. I don't know if you were here for the first part, but most, the vast majority of regions of the world have failed at doing this. And we have this moment in time due to technology, doing, being positioned. So that's the shift fundamentally. Does that help? So not, I mean, does that kind of, okay, okay. So if you'd like to so, um, contact us yeah. uh, later after the meeting, maybe we could delve into it. Yeah, I'd be glad to give you my card. And then, then a couple of other questions were UCSC. We have engaged UCSC quite a bit. They did an economic study, I think, was presented. Did you see? I don't know if you saw that, but it. Okay, okay. And then we then we worked with Dr. Fisher, who uh, helped us see if there was any places to do recharge in the basin. So that was quite an ex a, uh, extensive study. Um, I also occasionally teach it up there. They asked me to come present on water, and we have, uh, I think, I don't know if we've had an intern from up there or not. I think maybe Harbor High and some other schools. Um, but to tell you the truth, we typically focus on Cabrillo College, and then and, and Santa Cruz kind of takes UCSC for the most part. But we have a lot of collaboration with Cabrillo. So I tried to take notes. I hope that's of, of some help. Anyway. I'd like to comment also. Just to reiterate, there's a really a, a paradigm shift here going on in terms of the rate structure. And the, that shift is like Ron talked about, the fact that we are close to having the supplemental water supply online, which will be recharged and injected into the, the low parts of the basin, the, low, the parts of the basin with low water levels to keep seawater the slow or or stop or reverse seawater intrusion is makes a big difference because before when we were heavily the rate structure was heavily um, it was the goal part of the goal you have to be fair you have to be legal but part of the goal was we didn't have that supplemental or supply so we didn't know whether we could stop the seawater intrusion, and by by people using less water, that at very least would slow it down. So it's it's a real paradigm shift. Um, it would be great if we were doing this a year or two from now, after Pure Water Soquel was online, and we were able to see what the effects of the recharge and in, injection are, and that that it's working, but it's not how it happens. We have, we have to do the rates now. And I'll just add, you know, it, it is hard to understand. It's a lot of information. Uh, and, you know, these are business meetings that are presented to the board, but we do try to break it down. But that's even the, the re real reason why we have a, uh, a, a advisory committee. I think 10, 10 community members volunteered for that and stuck it out, one of them's here tonight, uh, for since April, meeting a couple, you know, several, many, numerous times to help digest it and put forth a recommendation, and, and that's what's in front of the board tonight. So not everybody has to do the, the heavy lift and to ensure that, you know, their input is being captured and, and conveying, hopefully conveying the, the, the majority of the thoughts of the, of the community uh, digesting that so not everybody has to do the heavy lift because it's tough. I think you have one more member, it looks like, President Christensen. There might be more. Yeah. You want? Yeah. Yes. Hi, uh, my name is Trink Praxel, and um, I live in the seascape area. I've been to some of the meetings in the past, but um, I wanted to 
I knew looking at a rate structure is always very challenging, very difficult. And I wanted to present the voice of many of um, your users who understand the drastic situation that we have been in <clears throat> and really support the SoCal, I mean, the project and the, everything that the board and the staff have done to receive additional funding and support that. And I, I, people I talk to really understand that and support this, you know, what you're doing. And I, I just know that often you only hear the negative side. And I thought it was important to come tonight and tell you that there's a positive uh, perspective out there as well. And I think as you go through the next couple of months with the workshops and hearings, et cetera, um, I hope that you'll hear more of that. As many of you said, nobody likes a rate increase, but when you can explain the rate structure changes, which you know, I understand what you're talking about, and it makes a lot of sense. I'm glad to see the consideration of that three level and of being able to um, reduce that high increase that happens right now in the second level. I think that's really going to help many people. Um, it's still going to be a little bit more money, but it won't be as much as it could have been, you know, with, uh, it seems to be with this a two rate, so the two level. So hang in there, keep going. And I think you'll find the support for it out there. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so at the last meeting, I brought up um, the possibility of um, a tax somehow uh, for people moving into the district to offset the cost so that we can kind of take the onus off the people that live here. Um, there's all this mandated growth by the state. It's kind of interesting that we see mandated growth requests, yet they acknowledge that the water is a problem. So, uh, you know, we're expecting that energy costs are gonna go up, electricity and water, and that's, it's just gonna be too much for, uh, people who are fixed income. So is there a way to do this? And I talked to uh, Ron about this after the last meeting, and um, he said he would talk to legal about whether there was a way to do that because of Proposition 218. So I read through 218, and it seems like there is uh, a pathway to make something like that happen. It would take a two-thirds vote from the residents. Um, to institute some sort of fee for incoming people into the district. Um, and if we could figure out like the number of people coming in and how that might change the numbers a little bit that we could then in the future reduce the, um, the increases. Um, also, uh, part of the problem is people's being able to, people being able to afford this. Uh, so there's all this talk about ADUs, uh, which if people can afford them and there's ways for them to do that, um, that would supplement their income and allow them to afford. The hookup fees in this district are outrageous. So it makes it hard for people to even consider it. So um, that's something I'd like to see if it could actually decrease that. I know that's kind of moving in the wrong direction, but at the same time, it might produce some ability for people to afford the future. Thank you. Thank you. You want to reset the timer? I've only got three seconds. Can't talk that fast. Um, Becky Steinbrunner. It's too bad that Reftelis, who's being paid $161,000, can't be here to answer some of these questions. I'm glad to see uh, Mr. Nelson here because to be legally defensible, your rate increase has to show a need. We haven't seen any figures. We've only heard a verbal comment from uh, the Director of Finance that we're here because of an $11 million shortfall. We have seen no figures. We have seen no figures in um, terms of the different rate, rate increase 
the different structuring, the different percent of fixed income. We have seen no figures to show what is a 12% revenue increase? What is that dollar amount? And why do you need that amount? It has to be legally defensible. And it's not in the way that's being presented. It's given in vague terms that we are expected to accept without any documentation at all. What is the cost per unit of the Pure Water SoCal water? I asked that before, it wasn't answered, and that must be determined because that's what you're asking people to pay. You're asking people, you're calling it a sustainability uh, fee, but it is to pay for the Pure Water SoCal project and the debt that has come with it. While we may have a, a saltwater intrusion problem, your, your board and your staff have chosen the most expensive way to address it. Um, it is concerning to me that the director of finance keeps saying this is not moving the needle much. So what is happening here? We have no figures to help us understand what that is about. Please put into writing and figures what costs are being cut. Um, giving someone a $1,600 a month bonus, um, $1,000 a month bonus. It's Dinah Bruner. It's, um, it's, Please be respectful. Enough. You've answered other people's questions. Please be respectful. Are you going to answer mine? I'm asking a question. What sets mine apart from the other people? Please be respectful of your time. All right. And then in closing, I'm just going to say on slide nine, where it compares the three tier volumetric rates, that's not fair because the new tier right. two extends into. Um, straddles the old tier one and old tier two. So those vol values are not fair and not correct. Thank you very and people much. People have been trying to help you understand that, but um, it's, not, it's not fair. And I don't believe it's legally defensible. Thank you for your comments. Um. I really appreciate you guys putting out the 40%, 50%, and 60% out there. Um, I don't know how the others feel, but after I looked at them all, I'm back where we started at 50% being <laughs> kind of a good middle ground. I don't know how the others are. Feeling. I agree. When you're given three choices, the middle is usually the choice, but it also looks reasonable. Mm -hmm. And three tier rather than two, to uh, give our customers more control over their water bill. Um, I don't know what the other directors think, but I want, first of all, I want to thank the public for being here and for, and for talking. I, I know that it, um, it feels like you're not being heard, but you are being heard. So I want to let you know that. We can, we can reiterate, President Christensen, if you like, what we're asking the board to do tonight since we don't have the motion up in front. We still Thank you. have, uh, I think it's staff direction on oh, okay. what to come back with, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. That's correct. No motion is required. It's an option. We could just do staff direction if that's the preference of the board. Jennifer has something. Yeah, I just wanted to say that we're obviously tasked with a very difficult decision. And as directors, we're guided by um, our principles. And in this case, we have to follow fairness, um, social equity, legal defensibility and fiscal responsibility as our guiding principles. And it seems to me that the three-tiered structure does encourage and reward conservation, allows for individuals to take responsibility for their household water use, offers financial incentives for people to use water efficiently, and promotes environmental stewardship. I do think, though, that, you know, to really... Um, find and, and honor the fiscal responsibility that the 60% fixed rate service charge ensures a stable source of revenue, promoting fiscal responsibility for the water district. And the steady income helps cover operational costs and maintenance, reducing reliance solely on variable water consumption. And the stability will contribute to long-term financial planning and infrastructure investment. 
Um, and then further, I just think that what Leslie had proposed today should be followed up on. So that's my staff direction. I mean, I do think that um, it sounded like an idea to not do the pre-funding and to bring that first year down to 10%. I mean, I really like that. I know you said it doesn't change the needle much, but small things really matter. Um, so that's my input and thank you. Uh, any other comments? I think I made most of mine earlier. <laughs> I'm I'm all for the three tier. I have been for um, through the process. I decided that was the best way to go for people, especially because it did um, touch my heart that people with more kids they may be using 25. I don't know 25 gallons a day per person, but they just have too many people, so they end up in being hugely um, hurt financially by it when um, they're, all of us are maybe using 20, 25 in, per person, and um, you know we're under that needle where the 400 cubic feet you know ends and, or the five and it goes to the next level. So um, that was my reason and it seems like 40, 50, 60 percent um, doesn't add that much to any individual person or individual household. So um, I'm not sure if we shouldn't go to 60. I mean, I'll, I'll go with whatever. Um, you know, I'm not going to get mad if somebody's not agreeing with me on that one. <laughs> but, um, and, um, you know, the, the, there's a point where, you know, we can, there's a lot of, like, back and forth stuff about details, and, you know, we could be out there just wrestling all those details, and it'll still end up being the same. It's, the, it, it's not, um, it's not an easy subject, and um, little tiny details here and there about, uh, you know, $100 here, $1,600 there, isn't going to make a difference, just like two million dollars costs our our ratepayers what two hundred dollars each or a thousand. You know, I mean, it's you know, how do we reduce our costs? Maybe we should look at reducing our costs for um, legal actions. So, just um, just to clarify the. Options being presented to you this evening um, would lower bills for larger households because they are hitting that um, high upper tier, that tier two rate at forty dollars a unit. So it would it would help smooth that a little bit for some of your larger households. But I do want to point out that um, we I have received notification from the state, and I know Senator Padilla is working on this, but. Um, they are looking at making the low-income household water assistance program. We call it the LIWAP, but it's similar to the LIHEAP for energy. They're talking about making that permanent. And of course, the district will participate. We are participating now. Um, it's something you have to enroll in as an agency. The moment they made it available, the district enrolled. And we have made it available to our customers. If they make it permanent, then that will help some low-income households. We continue to outreach that whenever we can. We continue to talk to customers on the phone um, to try and make them aware of that program. The other thing is I know that there is an extension of the COVID arrearage program that we're looking into that might uh, benefit some of our customers as well. So we are looking at every avenue available to us to help those customers who might be struggling a little bit. So I have some things I'd like to see for next meeting. Okay. I, I think this is digestible, going two, five, and nine. Let's make a curve. Let's let's have all water uses and see what the difference is. It seems like 40% fixed is off the table. 15, 60% fixed are on the table, you know, been, been talked about. So maybe a, a, a continuous curve with water use in you could do it in, you know, under two cubic feet. Um, and the difference between the current bill 
and the proposed bill. Okay, just just to clarify, in order for us to stay on track for a February 20th public hearing, we do need to bring the draft rate report to the board at the December 19th hearing. We can still bring that information, but we're hoping that information. But but that would that would need to include either the modified two tier or the three tier, whichever the board decides upon, and one of the 40, 50, or 60 percent elections. The three tier is. That's what I've heard. It's That's well, our um, consensus now. I mean, if I, I guess it, just to make it really clear, I'm going to just make a motion, and then okay. we can see that we have him bring back the three tiers, and and I'm proposing 50%. I know, I've seen it over the years slowly get more and more, and I think this is a gradual increase. Okay, but I, I, okay, but can, I can still we can, can the leave the motion the and that we also institute. And also um, use the savings that she talked about for delaying the, the payments to the pension plan so that that can be a, only a 10% increase. So that's, I'm just putting it out there, 53 tier and utilizing that 10% first year and then keep discussing. We could look at 60 for next year or next time or whatever it is. That, yeah. Yeah. The, oh, I thought I was. I, we could look at 60% for a future rate study. Well, the reason I'm not letting go of the 60 necessarily, I was part of the group at the rate committee that we agreed on the 50%, but the, uh, we, the non-mythical million, $11 million that we experienced was due to decreased water sales. And I think when you look at these uh, the structures and the past uh, uh, fixed costs that we charged uh, charged in the previous rate study, it looked like it was forty percent, mm -hmm. roughly forty percent. Yes, and I'm worried that fifty percent is just not enough because uh, we we're moving into volatile times uh, according to our the climate modeling. I think we. We are in uncertain times climate-wise. I think we need a little bit more stability. Um, and I'd like to discuss it further before we give up on it. My reasoning is partially just because it hits the going, having go to 60% hits the lowest users the most. And while I wanted to see things even out, I just thought maybe it seemed like too much at once for the lowest water users. I think that's a fair argument, too. Uh, it'd be, be used to HCF, which is under 50 gallons a day. You, the proposed bill at 60% would be $100.56. $10 less if you do 50%. So I just... I think it's a very simple thing to do, to, to plot up 50 and 60 percent, like what the uh, difference between current rates and proposed rates are. And the other piece of information I'd like to see is how many people are in these different classes, because there's a lot of people in that low, in the, the lower classes. Correct, and I believe that was at, uh, in the slides for the November 20th meeting. Well, then you you wouldn't have to do any additional work yeah. but just yeah. plot I think, it up I on. think it's roughly do you have access to it right now oh we don't have a screen yeah <laughs> yeah. yeah I believe I believe by the time like 12,000 people right? yeah, by the time you hit five units a month you're covering at least seven seventy percent of our customer base 71 percent I believe by the time you hit nine units a month eight or nine units a month you're at 90 93 percent I think of our customer base yeah. so yeah but when you're looking at just only two and no, you know, not including other people that use two and above. Yeah, that's like 40-ish, somewhere around. Yeah. yeah. And then are half of them rentals? A, a lot of the people who are using two units a month or less are um, people who are using no water. Right. And that would be a, a lot of your second homes and vacation. Yeah. Properties. Yeah. That makes a difference to me. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Yeah, and we can point out that the higher fixed rate would target those vacant houses too. It would make it more socially equi equitable. President Christensen, just from a procedural. 60. 60. Yeah. Just from a procedural perspective, we do have a motion on the floor, so we may wish to see if there's a second. And if there isn't, then we could move to an alternate. Can we repeat the. Three tier um, and 50% um, fixed and utilizing the savings that Leslie described for the pension prepayment this year so to make the increase only 10% the first year. Can I go for uh, another motion? I'd do the exact same as Tom, except for I'd make it 60% fixed rate. I'd second that. We have your voice vote. All in favor? It's the board's discretion whether you wish to have a voice vote or a roll call vote. Uh, um, before we vote, I. I just, I agree with Tom that, you know, what 60% does, if you look at uh, 900 uh, cubic feet a, a month, is it decreases from the current bill by over $50. So what you're doing is you're shifting the burden to the lower users. And I'm, I'm okay with having it be more um, no big shifts, you know, no step increases for higher use or less step increase. But I'm not sure I want to shift that burden to the yeah, 12,000 or 70% of our users who are less. See, it's than, 17, $17 a month. A quick comment, maybe all of the low um, users, including myself, haven't been paying our fair share in infrastructure costs and maintenance costs all these years. And I'll just elaborate on that in case it's... Oh. I don't know. Did he say 17 or 70? 70%. 70 no, dollars. dollars. Oh, 17. It was about eighteen dollars. It's eighty-two. Uh, the difference between the forty and the sixty that proposed. I misheard that. <laughs> was I? At the two eight CS. Uh, yeah, no. Are you talking uh, about the proposed fixed charge? The difference in the proposed fixed charge from fifty percent to sixty percent is about. Looks like about sixteen dollars a month more, sixteen or seventeen dollars a month more if it's sixty percent as opposed to fifty percent for the five, five eighths inch for five, five eighths inch meter, correct. And there's an additional increase in the volume charge at the low water use too. Right. Yeah. Combined is a little bit more. So I think the uh, comment. What do you that need, dude? Do do for next meeting. You have to have a draft plan. Yeah, I have to be. So we have to decide between 50 and 60. Yeah. So go ahead. So, Director Lather, I think the clarification on your question was from slot, uh, page 43 of 58 of the packet, where the current bill for a, use, a household that uses two units of water is currently at $70.54. For a 50% split, the proposed bill would go up to $90.34. And then, $0.34, cents, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. The three-tier, $90.26. And the 60% fix would go up to $100.56. So now I know what my bill's going to be. You don't change your usage. I mean, wasn't there a motion and a second yeah. for the we 60%? Had the vote yet. We were trying right. to have the vote. <laughs> there was, this, is, this is hard for all of us. 
clarifications. Um, wealth, yay or nay? Let's go down the list if we're not allowed to. You are. So just a clarification, if you'd like to do a roll call vote, you can. If you'd like to do a voice vote, um, you do. It's up, it's up to the board. Yeah. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Nay. <laughs> Very resounding. It passes. The low voices were nay and the high voices. So we will return at the December 19th meeting with a draft rate report incorporating the three-tier structure and a 60% fixed charge. Okay. And, and, and the reduction in the first-year uh, costs of, of the pre-funding. President Christian, it's okay. I just want to make a brief comment about the uh, um, public comment related to uh, defensibility. Um, I just want to provide a little context both for the board and also for the public. Everything that we have done, including tonight, is additional transparency beyond what's required. Um, so uh, what's required for, for uh, Prop 218 to, to um, establish defensibility is that rate study, which sort of is the homework that we're doing to justify the rates. So everything that, that staff has done to date, everything the board has directed us to do to date is additional transparency to help the public sort of understand the need for this and also for you to con carefully consider all of your options. So going forward is really when the defensibility piece starts. Um, based on all the work we've done to date. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> so my earlier request is null and void. We've decided. Too bad I didn't suggest 55%. <laughs> yeah, you could have. <laughs> I, might, I would have gone for the 55. <laughs> I would have gone for 55. <laughs> well, is there any other... Anything else required of us here tonight? Yeah, yeah there's 7.5, which is oh, I mean, not the next consider uh, item. Board, board appointments for various standing committee uh, committees. And I think Emma's going to talk to this one. She wrote the memo. So you want to take it away, Emma? Thanks. Yeah, thank you. I'd like your idea. <laughs> well, I also want to apologize that the screen's not working. There was a power outage this week in this room, and so some of the technology has been acting a little bit funky. Um, so item 7.5 presents all of the district standing committees and boards that the directors serve on, just to give context and also to make appointments and reappointments as needed. Tonight, due to vacancies and term expirations, it's the Finance and Administrative Services Committee and the... MGA, the Mid-County Groundwater Agency. If you want to make changes to any of the other committees, you can. And there's also a proposal, um, if the board's interested, to come back at the next meeting about consolidating the district street three standing committees. Is there a form? Can you explain what the, how that would look or what your ideas are? Or? Sure. So we, we haven't fully drafted a proposal. We'd bring that at the next meeting. But the idea is combine the current three committees into one or two. We'd probably lay out both options for the board to consider. And I think we're thinking right now they would meet bi-monthly and we'd invite all the current public members to serve on either one. Um, and our hope is to just have a little bit more efficiency and participation. And we think that that might be a good idea moving forward. Ron? Is there anything you I think you add? summed it up. I think you heard a comment from the public this morning, you know, along the same line saying, hey, um, is this an area where you could be a little more efficient? And so we're, you know, bringing that to the board to, to, to evaluate. Um, and, and I'll tell, just tell you amongst staff, there's various opinions, and that's usually a reflection of kind of how the board will, uh, will think. But we'll lay out the options, as Emma said, and see if there's, you know, if we want to, continue to evolve on the, on those committees or, or keep it kind of the same for the for the board if they want us to, to come back the next meeting or you you have the right to to um, uh, take action tonight on those if you like you get to the uh, uh, regarding the uh, should we not act on those then if we're thinking about um Consolidated, Go ahead, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think part of the problem, I, when was the last time we set up those? Was it two years ago, right? I think we probably should renew the process every year because 
the second year, there was a decided tail off in uh, public participation. Yeah, it's always been designed, or I mean, I mean, I remember the, the direction from the board, you know, modified as, as needed, right? You know, we're evolving, so it may need a different committee or may need less or something. So there's nothing, I mean, that's the beauty of a nimble organization, and we should change as, as you know, the, the situation dictates. So what I think I'm hearing is come back. Mm -hmm. Except MGA. Right, okay, except the MGA. Yeah, that, Emma, yeah. you got the computer up. Which ones do they, should they vote on tonight? Yeah, so if you want us to bring a proposal back at the next meeting, then I'd recommend taking no action on the district standing committees, but still making an appointment for the MGA. Can I just uh, make a quick comment about the combination? i just like to see the infrastructure and public outreach combined and then uh, the finance and admin services um, be separate. I would love to have more outreach um, because in the beginning it's really robust. So anyway, thank you. Um, can we get yeah, I agree. comment on I agree that the outreach committee is really important. Okay. Uh, any comments from the public? This, uh, this item. Uh, board appointments, standing committees. Okay. All right. That public comment is closed. Uh, no, I just was agreeing the importance of outreach. I don't think it ever be underemphasized. Yeah. Yeah. So, if I mean, right now, MGA, I've been serving on it for a while. If somebody else is interested, that's fine. Um, I am. There you go. <laughs> <I'm more interested. laughs> I go to the meetings anyway. <laughs> so well, I don't know. Can we currently go to the meetings if we're a board member and there's already two there? I have. Uh, I, I'll leave it to legal, yes. It, uh, yes, there's an exception in the Brown Act for a quorum of the board to attend a noticed meeting of another agency. Okay, good. Yeah. Okay. And Carla, do you still want to say? Uh, yes. <clears throat> I think I missed a couple of meetings this year, so I'd like to have one complete year. Yeah, okay. Yeah. My, my background is geotechnical engineering. That's what my master's degree is in, and I am not going to be working full-time next year, so I have a lot more time for the MGA, and I was hoping that I could be on it. How about this idea? Carla and Rochelle, and then um, Jennifer as the um, alternate. Sounds good. That's my motion. Second. Perfect. Thank you. Great. Great. Get the vote on it. Uh, we do have to do a vote, okay? Right. Yes, please. So that was your motion? That was your I'll vote. second it. <laughs> Too late. I already did. Oh, dang. <laughs> okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? No opposition. It's uh, passed unanimously. And that would start right away, right? So, like, the meeting... Later in December? No, it's, I think it starts January. That's what I'm wondering. At but least, does that start in January? As it's start, written. The meeting is this Thursday. As it's written, it's January 2024 to December 2024. Okay. Thank you. Well, just yeah, like, just just like the, the yeah. transition for vice president and president starts next meeting, is that right? Yeah. yeah. But the MGA starts in January. Yeah, the MGA is in January. Sorry to confuse it. Check. And then just to review uh, the JPIA, that's yeah, fine. Whenever there's a local meeting, I'll go to that meeting. <laughs> you know, Monterey or Sacramento. Um, Do we need a motion? The zone five and then the zone five. Oh. I, yeah, I. I haven't been able to attend. I haven't been able to attend those meetings. So, if somebody would like to attend, I'd definitely love to attend. Good morning. It's what day? Uh, it's every three months, right? It says fourth Tuesday of the month, um, at ten forty-five a.m. Yeah, that's right. Okay. I'll make the motion. Uh, Director Bob Boney is. On the uh, flood can represents us in the zone five Santa Cruz County Flood Control and Conservation District. Second. 
And then I, um, okay, all in oh. favor? Yeah. <laughs> oh. Uh, oh. Public comment. I already public commented on the whole thing. Uh, okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? That's passed. Um, and then the last thing is the LAFCO. And it says through, are you still a member of LAFCO? She's 27. She's good till 2027. Seven. Seven. That's what it says. <laughs> There's a typo in there. And then um, do we need a motion to have you bring back the standing committee or is that just direction to staff? Okay. Oh, yeah. So, Back to uh, now uh, we move on. Director, uh, President Christensen, let me just ask Emma. Emma, do we need to do motion five regarding Aqua JPIA? Did we do that? President or, Christensen. Oh, Carla spoke up for that. Okay, yeah. I'm sorry. I, I just want to make sure we covered all this. There is no vote, but there's. To reappoint, so maybe. I'll make the motion just to be clear. I'll second. Oh, okay. Reappoint, Carla. So there's no, not even a change. I just, yeah, I just want to make sure we cover. Vote on it. That's why I did it. Yeah, you you were correct. I was wrong. I just wanted to make sure we were covering all bases. I'm sorry for the inconvenience. Um, so we did. I did make a motion. Can I second it. We do have a motion and a second. So you know, just okay. If it's comfortable. We can simply vote. Aye. Yeah. Any opposed? Aye. I'm sorry. I'm in favor. I was delayed. Yeah. <laughs> She's on a tape delay. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Is that it? <laughs> that is it, except for closed session, in which we allow no, no, public we comment. Four point over to four point seven. Four point six. Um, oh yeah. Annual reporting of exempt and non-exempt surplus land, and it was pulled by by me. Right. I, I guess I need an explanation of the significance of being exempt and non-exempt. Right. And also what the plans are for the properties. Right. So we'll, we'll team that. Uh, Nick, Emmerich, our O&M manager, I think will come up to the mic up here. And Josh, are you able to handle the exempt, non-exempt? And then we can dive into the meat of it. Thank you. I just couldn't figure it out easily. size and that that's roughly the distinction between the exempt and non-exempt so you can still sell them for some nominal that's correct you can sell them um, and okay. what, what has happened a lot of times in these cases is sometimes there may be an adjoining property owner who might want right. to slightly large enlarge their property okay thank you and then the plans for some of these there's no current plans for any of these sites uh, I think that um, there's there's been discussions in the past, but um, I, and I can address that. I have yeah. a little knowledge that that, that Thanks, predates Nick. Nick. If you remember, oh, uh, I don't know, a couple of years ago, uh, roughly, the board we made a decision. I think it might have been the time before we brought it back last time. Uh, the direction was let's get Pure Water SoCal online because there may be, need parcels where they could be small, but we need a pump or we need a reservoir or something like that. So uh, at that time, uh, and we feel comfortable, then we would may be able to make some more um, uh, recommendations that, that had some more thoughtful consideration behind them. But for right now, we're kind of stuck in that limbo. Um, okay, so, so 
we're now soon will be able yep. to. Yep. But for example, the, the optimization study may uh, that we're doing may indicate that a uh, you know I'm just hypothetical here, but it could indicate that a holding tank would be good to help recharge other parts of the basin to help Santa Cruz that sort of thing. So There's probably nothing up in the Glenwood area. Probably probably not up in the uh, the Glenwood area. So that's probably one that can. Um, you know, we've had talk around that could come off. We don't see a lot of use. The Glenwood property, for those who don't know, it's roughly 100 acres. Is that right, Nick? Yeah. 110, maybe. And it's it's a very steep ravine area that we had hoped uh, at, way back when uh, we could potentially build a dam on it and create a reservoir. Now, a dam is a four-letter word these days. Earthquakes came into, uh, into the picture Right. Certainly with, with NOAA, you see dams coming down, not being constructed. Uh, so, go ahead, and water rights have been fully allocated. Uh, we have no water rights to that stream, and, and Soquel Creek is fully adjudicated. I think at one time we also considered, as we were looking at ways to save money or generate income, it was also to maybe harvest wood. What What is the opportunities of harvesting wood from that property as an as a revenue stream um, that isn't affected, I believe, by Prop 218. Yeah. So we're, we're, we're evaluating those things, and okay. we certainly take the direction from the board, you know, whether, uh, you know, uh, proper forestry techniques to, to uh, thin out the forest and, and generate some revenue. And like Melanie said, the attractive thing to that is it's not 218. Um, limited so it could it could help people that you know we often try to help that we we don't have a means to do that right well, maybe you'll propose something in the future where that's an option versus selling them yeah well we'll look at the economics of it it might be better just to, to sell it i mean the, the proposal you think 100 acres up there is going to bring a, a ton of money but taj i don't know if you remember but it wasn't it was a how much some something in that range it wasn't that great i, I mean it's still it's not a um uh, Might as well put it to better use. Yeah, right, exactly. And if we do decide to sell, how long a process is that? Josh, you have an idea on that? Roughly. <laughs> <laughs> months, years. Oh, yeah, yeah month, months to short years. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Nick. Thanks for sticking around. One item he saw. Public comment. Well, Public comment. Yep. Oh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Director LeHue, for pulling this. I have questions too. And I have wondered why the district has just clung to these properties um, when they could be sold. And it would be a very good time to sell them. The district certainly needs the additional money, um, even if it is a small amount. Um, for example, the lot on Redwood Drive in my neighborhood, I do know that the uh, adjacent property owners would likely be interested in it. So why not? Why not? Um, regarding the Glenwood property, um, I would like to see an analysis done uh, in conjunction with Dr. Andy Fisher to see if this is a potential recharge area for perhaps a stormwater collection and a recharge managed uh, aquifer recharge project. I'm wondering why the Capitola Avenue uh, property uh, that the district purchased as a potential um, treatment plant site for the Pure Water SoCal and purchased and demolished two historic homes on and sent off some Section 8 people that really wanted to live there. Um, why isn't that on here? Um, because you, under the definition of uh, surplus property, you don't need it. Um, although it was purchased, one of the parcels, there are a number two parcels, I think, there. One was to potentially expand office, but um, why, why not sell it? Um, and there is also, of course, aside from land, there is... Um, property that the district owns, such as the trailer that was purchased as a construction trailer for the Pure Water SoCal project and sets empty because 
the district decided to lease another office space closer to the construction site, which makes sense, but there's that empty trailer. So I hope you will uh, consider doing some recharge on the Glenwood. If, if you don't, then please sell it. Thank you. President Christensen, I'll just say there was, again, some misinformation. We do not have empty trailers. There are office space, but... Thank you. That's incorrect. They own the district owns that trailer, so there's nothing. Oh, please, President Christensen, into it back and forth, and Ms. Steinbrenner, please respect the decorum of the. Please respect the decorum of the proceedings. Thank you. You know, the com discussion about all that property is out of the purview of this of this item. Uh, I think we're. I think we're good. It just says adopt resolution twenty three. We would request a motion if the board is comfortable to move forward. I move approval of the item. I second. Uh, do we have to do a roll call for this? I don't know. Just to make sure. It's up to the board. Uh, vote. Okay. Let's vote. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Okay. So I think that's it. Yes, we'll be entering into a closed session. So that's the uh, end of the public part of the meeting tonight. And the public are like invited to comment on closed session item. Thank you. Um, as a public comment on closed session, I, I just want to tell you again that I have taken all action, not because I want to, but because it is important and, um, and I care about the ramifications what has happened, what has not happened. And um, it has taken a big toll on me, on my life, my family's life, but it is important. And that is why I've done it. I do not want to cause unnecessary expense as Ms. Lather sort of insinuated <laughs> legal costs. I, I didn't want to do that and I don't want to do it yet, but You haven't followed the law. The California Department of Fish and Wildlife has never been consulted, and that is law. That is CEQA law. You can laugh. Go ahead and laugh. But it is a, it is a law that the district collaborate with Fish and Wildlife to determine a set of mitigations that are legally enforceable. It is the law in CEQA. I don't have the code right here. I'll mail it to you. You can look at that. So I have only done what I've done because I care I, and I'm not alone. Many people are very concerned. And um, I only wish that you could have delayed this a little bit, this project a little bit, because now likely by the end of this month, direct potable reuse will be legal in the state of California. Hopefully, you will still use those expensive injection wells and inject potable water and partner with the city of Santa Cruz in ASR. Thank you. Okay, we are now beginning closed session. And uh, President Christensen, I have a brief announcement on 8.2. Um, for that item, uh, the board will be meeting in closed session related to potential litigation arising from an investigation by the Office of Inspector General related to meetings attended by Director Jaffe on behalf of the district. 